Hello, I'm Dave Lees, and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Jonathan Byer. Hello. And today we're thrilled to welcome choreographer extraordinaire Tom Dixon. Tom, welcome to The Skating Lesson. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Yeah. So, I don't know if Jonathan knows this, but you've choreographed for his very favorite skater, Satoko Miyahara. So... And my and my favorite free skate of the of the season was yeah. is Madam Butterfly for sure. Yeah. So I guess let's start with let's start with breaking down um, the different American ladies uh, that happened at the uh, at the Olympics. There's been some talk about program components, who's the strongest, who's the weakest. So let, I want to know you you see Mariah Nagasu fairly often at the World Arena. Do you think that her program to Miss Saigon, is that, do you think that's its original state? Have transitions been taken out? You know, how, you know, is that the natural state of the program? Uh, well, having worked with her, I know that she does have the tendency to leave things out. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that was not its original state, especially going into the triple axel. Okay. <laughs> now, Mariah's always been known for her speed. So I guess, what can you right. tell us about her skating? You know, what does she do particularly well? Well, she's very strong. She's very determined. Okay. You know, I've watched her work on that triple axel ad nauseum the whole year, and it really paid off because uh, it, it became nice. It became clean. It was a great jump. Unfortunately, she didn't do it in the singles event, but um, kudos to her for sticking to it. Mm -hmm. Now, so my question to you as a choreographer is when you have a skater that has a, a really big element like that, that that right. clearly does take understandable amount of concentration like you know we see her understandably so kind of disconnect from the program in order to get that focus for that going um do you, is this something you encountered a lot when you have a skater that kind of has this huge element they need to get kind of get through or are there ways strategically that you can place that in a way so that's a little less obvious well i think if you're going to be a complete skater that should not be apparent. You know, to say having worked with Satoko for seven years, there isn't one second of any of those programs where she ever sacrificed the choreography for, for a jump. Granted, she's not doing the triple axel, but she's been doing triple triple since she was 11. Um, right. So I do think it's possible. I think it comes down to technique that you don't have to think about. You know, I call it the nuts and bolts of skating. Position and flow and direction all have to be there at your command so that you can manipulate them musically, whether it's a triple axel or, or a choreographed step. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't quite buy it as an excuse, you know. Okay. Now, so the guys, now that they have all these quads, now who's going to use nuanced movement and dynamic change right up until their quad? I think that's the next thing we need to start seeing. Okay. My thing with Mariah, you know, she's known for being very strong. I was wondering why they went with all of the lighter piano parts of Miss Saigon, because there are some very dramatic, bold pieces of music. Heavier. Yeah. You know, Leah Salonga is on, um, you know, the soundtrack, the, you know, the cast recording of that. And I was wondering why they didn't choose to use some of that, because it could highlight Mariah's strength. It could create more of a moment at the end of the program. I guess when you try to create a program and you're doing the music at it, what's your approach? Do you try to have more highs and lows? How do you... You know, you do. Well, it depends on the skater. Ironically, I did a Miss Saigon for Satoko two years ago, three years ago. Okay. Um, well, now you're doing that... the version, the better yeah. version of Miss Saigon. <laughs> <laughs> Butterfly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> my, my favorite program of hers was the, the Mars and Venus one. Yeah, absolutely. The Star Wars one. But yeah. um, uh, it depends on the skater. You mm -hmm. know, at the same time, that may be true with Mariah, but also at the end of the day, you need to learn how to change your dynamics and your emotional range. Um, if you go all strong, then she appears unsensitive. You know, mm -hmm. if you do too sensitive, it might feel out of character for her skating. So, I think someone like Mariah just uh, needs to keep working on how do you change dynamics, how do you change emotion, and get your content in. You know, that's part of being an artist on the ice. Yeah, it's interesting because she was originally so emotive as a young skater, and then it mm -hmm. got lost, and now. They're trying to bring it back, and you have the red dress. You know, I want some skating worthy of a bright red dress. I think that's kind of where. Mm -hmm. um, now, how about Karen Chen? Because she's someone who changed the program three times throughout the season. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what do you make of her skating? She seems to have more speed than any of the other American ladies. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, what do you see when you look at Karen's programs? I think she's still a diamond in the rough. You know, I know she does a lot of her own work, which is great. But at the same time, you need someone to give you some new vocabulary and some new ideas and push you artistically. I'm not sure she's done that. Um, yes, she's fast, but it, sometimes I find her maybe a little mushy in that speed. And she also needs to work on you know, staccato and legato movements. I'm big on music. I know you're, you're in opera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I that's would... not just why I like Madame Butterfly, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been a musician since I was 10. I play the oboe, so I understand that. I tried to relate that a lot to skaters, you know, changes up dynamics and changes up tempo. Um, mm -hmm. Use the Italian words, because, you know, what better way to describe it? Absolutely. So I think someone like um, Karen needs to work on those contrasts, whether you want to call it legato and staccato or in dance language. Well, and I, I'm actually really glad you brought that up, because, um, as, as a musician, when I personally am looking at the programs, I used to tease Dave, what does the music ask for? Right. So like, we'll have a big step, you know, like a step sequence and then a big flowing spiral, but yet the music is kind of the same for both. And it was like, well, how are you hearing the same types of music? And one is a very intricate, involved series of steps and one is a big grand gesture I, I don't understand if, if if you could be playing anything in the background i start to disconnect from the program i guess and, and, that, and that happens a little for me that's for me the biggest argument that we are not for this part it's a sport you know? yeah because like in music it's not just about playing louder and faster music right the music unless we had those contrasts of flows and fast absolutely and, yeah. and skaters have to learn to react to that and to me it comes back to your technique if you have solid technique and complete edge flow and effortless workmanship of your blade, it's so much easier to change dynamics and change emotion. Right. You know, I look for, especially when I choreograph, and Satoko's quite good at this, she can change emotion and dynamics right before a jump. She also has at her disposal multiple, multiple directional skating. For example, on a choreograph step, she skates the opposite way. Right. Um, not very many people can do that, especially at the end of the program, and use that to build an emotional impact. So that's, to me, one of her strengths is that she can do that, and she can do it easily in any direction. So one of the things that stands out to me about Satoko and uh, Carolina Costner is that they, you know, they, they're not all, the movement is not all on one plane. There are highs and lows. In addition, you know, I think about Satoko can use, use a lunge very effectively. She can get low on the ice. And I don't see that with Karen, um, with Brady and Gracie Gold. I used to, you know, really always think about that. She always looked like she was on one plane. So how much is that? Do you build that in? Do you think about like low movement, high movement, you know, changes of plane? Yeah. I mean, all that is spatial awareness. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I teach spatial planes. There's, there's certain planes that are cardinal planes on the body, how you move through space, and there's obviously three horizontal planes, medium high. I mean, that's, that's elementary in dance, you know, but again, skaters need to be reminded of that. We have such a huge space, much more huge than a dancer or an opera singer on the stage in comparison. So for me, it becomes more important mm -hmm. if you're not one level, one So I guess another, you know, Brady Tunnell is young and fresh, um, in one sense, although she's not her first year senior, but what is your take on a cin the Cinderella program? Because this has kind of been debated, picked apart a little bit. I wasn't the biggest fan of the music choice. I didn't think it seemed Olympic or very senior. So, you know, what is your take on appropriateness? of? As far as an image, I think that's a great image for her. And I, I would, she would be my bet for the person that has the most potential. Like she has a great big body. She has at her disposal, obviously, some natural skating talent that needs to be tapped in on. Maybe what you didn't like is she combined the Disney version. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be done. Maybe it should. Who knows? Um, and she does hit. She does hit certain positions with nice extension, and then other positions lack a little bit in there. But it was the kind of thing that, from someone on the outside, made me think that the potential was certainly there. It should it be developed properly? And you feel you feel like the potential is there. She has the natural ingredients. She just needs a chance to explore those and, and kind of what 
Karen Chen has done, she needs to do, and what Karen Chen needs to do is what Brady Tanell said. She's very schooled, she's very learned, so she needs Tanell needs to now interject some of what she feels her scheme needs to be, and some of that's self exploration. Some of that's going to be getting help from people that can help her expand her vocabulary. And I mean, again, I could do an hour long show with you about Miyahara, but uh, <laughs> the the um, I especially love her step sequence, like you mentioned, and everything that she did is so amazing, and it's so perfect for her, and she does it better than anyone else could do that particular step sequence. Right. So when I was watching Brady's, you know, it's during the clock, like countdown, you know, sort of part of the program, and choreographically, it seems so fascinating in concept. I could see where the idea was, what they were trying to achieve and what could be done. But it was that unfortunate thing where I wondered if that exact step sequence had been given to another skater, even say Caitlin Osman or something, that it could have been done more effectively. So I don't know in your experience in working with younger skaters like Brady, how much you try to push them and give them something that they can grow into or how much you're actually catering certain step sequences to that particular skater? Well, I've done some Cinderella programs. I did a Cinderella program for Ryan Yonke. We didn't use the, the, the clock striking 12 part, but that is, that's a difficult piece of music, I think. Yeah. Because how do, you, how do you interpret trying to get out of there before you change back into rags? And do a step sequence, do a triple sow cow. <laughs> Um, it, you know, the clock was a unique solution to that. I thought it was an interesting concept. I just wasn't sure if it fit her specifically so well. Well, like I said, it's a difficult thing to interpret, and um, she probably just needs to work on refining her movement vocabulary. And but like you said, first year, she's done phenomenally for how she deals with the pressure. Not having that experience in her in her back pocket is amazing. So I, I look forward to seeing what she'll do in the future. So in bringing up Satogo, moving on, I wanted to know, she's, you know, such a beautiful skater on the ice, and she, how much of that is her, and how much of that is her coach really demanding that she maintain the choreographic integrity, that she develop the skating skills? I mean, how much uh, credit should Mia Hamada get for? The Quite a bit. I mean, it's also Satoko's nature to work hard and pay attention to everything, but I have to give credit to Hamada, who I think is a brilliant coach. Like she'll say to me all the time, Tom, I don't want ugly skaters. I want everything to be beautiful, you know, regardless of the jumps you're going into. And so that has a lot to do with it. Because when your main coach says that, then how do you argue? Especially in the Japanese culture, how do you argue? Yeah. You know, Satoko has never been a bad girl. She has never talked back. She's, like I said, she's never disabused choreography. She's the most... I've never worked with a student quite like that before, even in Japan. So, how many of Miyamata students have you worked with? Uh, Marin Taichi. She has the little Honda. Um, mm. uh, what's her name? Sara. Sara. Yeah. Yeah. I worked with her this last season. Um, I've watched her go from we used to call her Winnie the Pooh because she was just a little, like toddler. <laughs> um, I saw her before she can even do an axle, and every time I'd come back, it's like, oh, there's a double axle. Oh, double axle. Next time, triple salco. Now it's triple lutz, triple toe. In a matter of a couple of years, it's like amazing. But her, um, Rika Kihara, mm -hmm. Kihara um, yeah, a couple others you probably don't know of from her. No. Team. What can you tell us about Marin? Because to me, she has some sort of X factor on the ice. You know, she communicates very well with the audience, she expresses music well. You know, what is it like working with her? Um, not the same as Satoko. She's a little bit maybe lazy. Those are those are Coach Hamada's words, not mine. Hamada has <laughs> said her. that, yes. You know, when she has Satoko to compare to, who never talks back, only works hard, does seven long programs a day, which is why she got injured. Um, in comparison, Marin tends to rely on her natural gift and talent. So. Now, would you see that she's, is she lazy compared to an American skater? By, Amer by American standards, is she? <laughs> this is the average American, probably. Okay. But in Kamada's camp, she's kind of pretty lazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is Rika Kihira like? Yeah. Great. Yeah. She's always in a good mood. Um, 
I would say she's the closest to Satoko in her work ethic. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really pleased with how she developed her movement and her vocabulary this year. She made a huge jump in the last um, year. Yeah, I really agree. I thought that she started to have star quality on the ice that I didn't see a year ago, I thought. Yeah. And again, she threw her triple axel in the short and the long at nationals, Japan nationals. Did not sacrifice the choreography for it. You know, mm -hmm. could have, you would have thought she's going into a double. There was, there was no sacrifice of anything for that. And to learn that at a, a young age is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's the next <laughs> phase of skating. You, you know, we're going to get to the point where you can only do so many quads. Who, who knows? Maybe someone will do a quint. But there needs to be a sense of musical education. If we are going to skate to music, your body has to interpret the changes in that music. And can, who can do that for the hardest jumps? To me, that's where we need to go. And, and I'll tell you, I've listened to some of the PCS seminars or certain judges pontificate about educating skaters in music. And often I think um, it is made to seem more complex than it really is. I, I mean, one of the differences for me, again, Miyahara and Costner, I can tell are, it starts with the simple baseline of their listening. Yeah. If, if you're listening, you'll hear something. You don't, you don't necessarily need to study what harmonic change is happening or which tempo change is happening where. You just have to listen and respond. And I think often, um, especially with some of the lower level skaters, as NBC would often show us an unusual crop of skaters, like from 24 to like 18 or something, and then break away and then come back to the main contenders, is when they're all finishing or hitting big beats of the program completely off the music and uh, as a musician it's just kind of mind-blowing to me because i don't understand how you could possibly be listening to the music and have missed that moment you know um well, again i believe at an early age you have to have to bake in musicality into your technique because yeah. like a musician if you're not proficient on your instrument you aren't going to interpret those changes of dynamics yeah so you have you to gotta, you gotta have a that, that demands that and teaches that as part of the technique. So often I'll hear coaches say, oh, right, ignore the music, just think technique. I'm like, no, musicality should be your technique and technique should be your musicality. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. So and that, in that regard, that, I think a lot of judges make it almost seem like you have to be God to get their highest mark in, in components. And it's pretty simple, it's like you said, listen to the music, allow yourself to be affected by the music and create a technique that can work with the music, not again. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think my biggest thing that I see with current skating that really bothers me is how components are judged because so often now, if a skater lands their jumps, their components will just be in the nines, in the high eights and nines. And often, for I think it really is unfair because if you have a Carolina Costner, uh, a Satoko uh, Miyahara, they they're not getting rewarded aptly for the difference. I mean, the difference in jumping ability is reflected on the first mark, but the difference in the artistic is not. And that's always well, kind of... In the case of Satoko, if you read the rules that they've set forth, they talk about multi-directional skating. Satoko, like I said, is the queen of that. She does a reverse wally into her triple saka so easily that people don't even think it's unusual. Mm -hmm. She can do reverse split jumps. She spins both directions, and I don't think she gets the credit for that. Mm -hmm. That should be reflected in the components, probably under skating skills. Mm -hmm. Well, and same thing also, you know, uh, and I used to think this about like Joshua Ferris and things like that. They take the skating skills mark and hook the rest. So with Josh Ferris, with uh, Miyahara, like these things, the programs and the choreography is so much more sophisticated than everyone else is that, okay, fine, maybe someone skates faster, maybe someone skates bigger, but if you're talking about the choreography and the interpretation alone, I don't understand how they're not clobbering everyone else. And, and I understand, you know, technical this and speed that and big skating this, but like her projection and the sophistication and nuance and attention to detail is so far superior to everyone else, but yet it, somehow that that mark gets washed over too easily in my opinion. Again, I think it's it's a cultural difference, you know, as you probably know, there's a huge divide between Satoko's fans and people that aren't her fans. And right. the people that aren't her fans don't think she gives enough. And the people who are her fans acknowledge and admire the nuance. You know, and that, right. I think that 
nuance has a lot to do with her culture and her personality that was bred out of that culture. But again, that has to count for something. Imagine the music if we only had a label and presto and staccato. You know, people would get up and leave. It would be boring. and Unrelenting, yeah, exactly. And I, I hate to say it, but I'm just going to refer to them as the Zagmet, because I think basically Zagidiva and Medyeva do the same thing from in the same method, from the same camp, got the same score. They, yes, they have a lot of flair, but when they're when they go to, they are I, to me they're not skating to the music. They're not using the, the rhythm or the the, the ni- dynamic change of the music, um, like Costner and Miyahara and and Caitlin Osman. I actually think Osman should have won. I have to say it. You're yeah. not alone. Yeah. So I want to know Medvedeva and Zagitova. Do you ever find that they are just cr- like? It doesn't seem like it's choreographed to the music. Um, and it also seems that they are sometimes jamming in as many turns as they can, rather than doing a quality turn, uh, you know, for qualitative purposes. They just want to jam in as many transitions as possible for points. Right. Yeah. Do you find that? Yeah. Yeah. Like, again, if you relate it to music, you know, we have everything from a whole note to a 64th note in, in music. Everything they do is fleeting and ephemeral. Like you said, they're jamming and they lift their leg, but they kick it and it's gone in a second. I timed them actually. There was, there's a cool thing where they someone has put both of their programs side to side yeah. at the same time. And it's the same thing. They never hold anything for more than a, a second and a half. Nothing. Do you know what kills me? Is the Gitava does this knee slide, which should really be a highlight moment of when she's killing time for the first two minutes. <laughs> yeah, she does this knee slide and she doesn't even let it be a picture. Like if you were a photographer, you couldn't even take a picture of that movement because it's just like she's going for it and she's done with it and she's next thing. And it's like, no, honey, this is your like moment on the stage. And it it's, I wonder what a Terry is not seeing when they're in the rink every day. I don't. It's and again, if you're going to speak to music, you need to talk about how we interpret music and that should be considered one dimension. Like in contrast, uh, Caitlin Osman does this beautiful edge in the beginning for six seconds. She, I looked at the landing of her triple lutz, it flows forever, and that also is six seconds with a change of edge and an attitude at the end. That doesn't happen in, in the Zagmeds. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> with the Zagmeds, when. Down for some. <laughs> if you're gonna, they also, one of the things that really kills me about Medvedeva is that. She does the Sasha Cohen skid spiral where she brings her leg up, but the leg is... It was over one and a half seconds. I think that was three. (laughs) (laughs) So when she does this, when she brings it up, the leg is never fully extended upwards, which is very difficult to do, which made Sasha's so wonderful. And Sasha created a full picture with it and allowed it to happen. It just seems like they're rushing. Um, My other biggest pet peeve in skating, which I don't think the Zagmeds do but I noticed a lot of the American skaters is that when they do the Janet Lynn trademark back outside edge spiral and you flip it to the forward inside, so many one wobble on it, don't hit full extension and they rush through it rather than creating a full picture. That is nails on a chalkboard to me. If you're going to. My theory is if they can't hold it, they probably can't. Mm -hmm. So back to technique and edge flow and edge control. You know, if you have control, this is Janet's big thing. You can hold anything for as short as long as you want. You can change direction in any whim. And it gives your choreography a sense that it's just happening as it happens. I get the feeling with the Zagmeds, they're just doing it because they think it gets more points. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a good about She could be amazing. Mm-hmm. I think more. I'm much more into her skating than the, the Bedjiba. But I don't know if it'll happen in that camp. Well, and it's exactly what you're saying. It's there's a frustrating element that's really not to be placed on these girls, but perhaps more at the camp. I mean, again, why would anyone change anything? Because they're winning everything. No, no judge or score is telling them that they should. Um, but it, it's clear that they are capable of that, mm-hmm. and yet choose not to develop that. They have a sense of expression within. It's just not being tapped into. I find so. that they never hit a full extension. And when Medvedeva tries to, her leg goes to the back instead of being in a proper alignment. And it's, it, over, it looks overwrought to me. You know, she doesn't know proper placement of where that leg should be in the... They couldn't do a proper spiral. Yeah. No. Again, it's the nuts and bolts of skating. Position and direction equal flow. You have to have both of those in the right place to actually do it so that you can help hold that for a whole note or a half note. Or... 
So we were talking so, with Doug Haw about their actual skating, what the Zag Meds are doing, and about their stroking and their pushing, and he feels that they really are only skating off of one leg. Do you agree with that? Okay. Can you, do, I guess... It's as bad as some of the Russian, but it's the Russian limp where you push on to one foot and you don't really use the other one. Okay. So can you, are they not doing the, the second push? Is that what's happening on the, the... okay. Yeah. Like in skating, like I, I always say pushing is a dirty word. You need to press from the foot you're on. That's the essence of skating. That's what they call it, the slot, really sod and dance. You press from the foot you're on, you don't push to the foot you're trying to go to. When you push to the foot you're going to, it looks abrupt and it doesn't look effortless. And you get, you get less by doing more. In good skating, you get more by doing less. That's what makes it effortless. So what is Adam not doing on his back crossovers? Is he not getting the second push? Why does it... Well, I, I, when I worked with him, I tried to, to get him to change that. But it's a little, I don't know if it's from his early Russian influence, but it's a little bit of that limp. Okay. Same kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Do you, is that, how would you judge that in skating skills then? Because, I mean, Adam has, I find that he has wonderful positions, but the skating skill is not there. But the rest of the components, you know, he might have the interpretation, or, but it's not across the mark. Yeah. But again, who can use crossovers to interpret the music? That should be, those crossovers are the most basic thing in skating, mm -hmm. therefore we should be able to use them. Like, I think Satya does a really good job of using back crossovers in a choreographed sequence. The way she built and does them properly works with the music and adds to the, to the, the theatrical impact. Mm -hmm. um, not, not a lot of people can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, how about Kaori Sakamoto? Because it looks like she is trying to adapt some of the Russian pantomiming to her skating. <laughs> yes. Sign language choreography. Brady did it too. She's like, my heart. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> is this going to become a trend? Will we see this at U.S. Nationals soon? Is this? I hope not. Okay. I hope. It, you know, there's a good and a bad way to do everything. If you can figure out how to refine that kind of movement and make it your own. But when you get the feeling someone's just doing it because they think it's cool and they saw it elsewhere, I don't think that should be given that much credit. Mm -hmm. It just, to me, it came across a little elementary on her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry. in general, this kind of pantomime and all this sort of stuff, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I, I'm just such not a fan of the sign language choreography as they mimic the lyrics. So I, I'm intrigued also to get your take. You did Madam Butterfly without any of the actual singing in it. And I thought it was a very classy version of it. And especially in some of the edits, it can be tricky in opera to to cut those lines or sentences in half. So I actually thought it was a great idea to just use the instrumental version. But I'm curious when the lyrics are in a program, how much you're really interpreting the words through the story or you're listening to the overall, you know, phrasing and just interpreting it in a more broad scope. I think it depends on the music. Obviously, there aren't many people other than yourself in skating that would probably understand or know what those lyrics mean in an Italian opera. But on the other hand, people know the gist of the story. So to that extent, you, you can't ignore the lyrics. If you're going to use the lyrics, you have to do something with them. You know? yeah. But I'm afraid a lot of people just want to use lyrics because it makes them feel good. And there needs to be something more behind it. Than that. Okay. It was interesting you mentioned posing because... Carolina Costner's Afternoon of a Fawn was done in the Nijinsky fashion, which was a lot about posing and, well, we know the story of what, <laughs> what he did. It was rather controversial. Versus the Janet Lynn who took that same music and it was more about freedom of skating. And I, li I like the program, but that's a, an example of a good kind of posing, you know, and it's very difficult to do. And Glory did a good job of, of getting that essence in there, but still staying true to skating and making it skate. So for so. you, Carolina, did you like, what did you think of her short program? Did you like that, the Celine Dion? I, I love her short program. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that she... The, the long. I actually did a, an afternoon of fun for Adam that I quite liked the way, and we took more of the Nijinsky. He did the hands very well, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It has to have that 
there's a self-indulgence to it. Um, when you look at the original ballet, it was shockingly static. I mean, it almost wasn't dance. It was strict pantomime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought Adams was one of his best programs. The uh, I thought he really got into it and really... Yeah. You could tell that he had probably watched it, you know, and really... Interpretation. But he, uh, he adapted to that really well. I think he just loved the whole concept. Um, and I think as in, certainly in terms of males who have taken that on, other than John Curry, he's one of the better ones. What do you make so, of Adam's newfound fame? Are you as amused by it as everyone? It's, it's kind of incredible in a, in a sense, yeah. In a sense, in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, yeah. go do what, what you feel is right. Yeah. <laughs> You do you. That's right. what you just <laughs> said. All right. <laughs> you, you said that Kate, you felt that Caitlin Osmond deserved to win. Um, I definitely felt that she deserved to win the short program. I thought that her dynamics were just incredible and completely not rewarded compared to the others. What do you like about her skating and, and what she did? Um, well, I hadn't seen her long. So when, it, when this one like came on, I was ready to just tune out because... I'm so tired of Swan Lake, but, you know, the way she looked, the makeup, and, and she really paid attention to performing it with her body and her face, jumped brilliantly, like has the best jumps in the event, as far as I'm concerned, and skated cleanly. I went back and watched it from Canadians. She didn't skate well at all. So to go to the Olympics and skate perfect and bring it up several notches artistically, I just, I thought she should win. Mm-hmm. I like I like the direction she took. Obviously, more the Black Swan from the movie, not you know, sort of, because she isn't a typical balladic skater. So I thought it was a great vehicle for her to show her sort of tenacity with a swan like. Now this season, I think more than any other. I mean, Dave, you can speak to this if I'm wrong, but I feel like we've seen more repeat programs than ever at any Olympics. A lot of people bringing back old shorts, old longs. You know, some people bringing back for some time free skates for the third time. Like, I'm curious to get your take on on those kinds of choices in a in a world where, like, even you know, Miyahara could have brought back you know, programs that she only had a chance to skate for half the season and yet chose not to and create something new and innovative. But there was so much more recycling from everyone else going on. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I was tempted to, to suggest to them to do the Planets program again, just because she didn't um, get to do it the entire season last year. And also because she also ended up with an, an Oriental-themed short program, and I thought, you know, maybe it would show a different um, spectrum or movement, um, but you know, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't suggest it. I was thinking about suggesting. It. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so for that, I, and sure, I love the idea of doing Asia, in Asian in Asia. So they really yeah. like the Adam Butterfly. Yeah. What do you think of Gabby Daleman and her skating? I find that she has a lot of power. I thought that mm. the Carmen, as much as programs yeah okay <laughs> i thought that as much as um carmen is overused that she had the personality for carmen so it didn't there's nothing that bothers me more than when like you can't be carmen and she could be carmen yeah yeah there's one nothing... of her issues she probably has to learn to bridle her power it gets it gets away with her a lot yeah in skate it's not always the most powerful that are the best i mean look at miyahara you have to learn to Keep it in control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think. No, go ahead, Dave, because I was going to go somewhere else. No, go, Jonathan, go. <laughs> okay, I, I'm curious in your role as a choreographer. Now, forgive like the triteness of this next conversation <laughs> topic, but how much influence do you have then in the in the costume and packaging choices? Um, especially we saw with Carolina several versions of how she was going to interpret Afternoon of a Fawn, some more successful than others. Um, and, and so I was curious if you ever build 
a program while some girl's wearing Under Armour or Lululemon, and then you turn around and see it, and you're like, what is that? I would have done something else entirely had I known that's the direction. You know, if Lori knew that at Europeans, Carolina was going to come out in a chartreuse like jumpsuit that was bedazzled, she may have adjusted the whole concept of the program a little bit more. I would think that often they're intertwined. So I was curious to get your take on that, if you are a part of that. Oh, absolutely. But then again, you know, it depends on who you're working with. Some coaches and skaters are more open to that. Okay. Okay. I haven't ever had a complete costume disaster. Uh, cross my fingers. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> like in the in the case of Matt Savoy's um, Olympic program, um, the mission. Called? Mission. Thank you. I wanted that very ecclesiastical, sort of religious, pared down look, and the costume didn't look as good in the beginning as it did by by the time it got to Torino, and it took some adjustments to get there because obviously we got comments saying it's blah, it's this, it's that. But I think it ended up with just the right look where you got that feeling he was in doing a kind of program where you just couldn't be overdressed. You know, it was true to the period and true to the style. Mm. I mean, it. Sometimes I mean, I'm all for experimenting, and you know, maybe that for whatever reason that the, the uh, jumpsuit could have been great, but. Kudos to her for getting rid of it by the time the Olympics. I almost needed to inform the overall idea because it was such a bold choice that it, it really dominated the visual. Right. You know what I mean? So I think if that was the angle she really wanted to take, for all we know, Lori would have changed things to kind of take it in a different direction. Or even in Satoko's um, uh, short program, which I think is so beautiful to the memoirs of a geisha, the pink was a little, I wondered if it enhanced her movement. Or do you know what I mean? Like, um, or, or if that was a part of Lori's decision or if that was just on her or the coach or whomever. So I was just curious. Okay. Hmm. I, mean, I don't know the answer to that. I do know working with them, I'll always give them my general ideas and sometimes color will come out. Like, for example, Satipo, I didn't expect blue. In the beginning, I didn't like the blue and I took them that red um, but then as it went on I actually liked the blue mm -hmm. you know, okay. it's, a, it's a give and take process hmm. okay well what would you do for a skater um, like Maria Satskova because I find that the whole look the music the well I think Claire de Lune can be very beautiful I didn't think it enhanced her skating I found it very beige and gray and kind of monotone forgettable I guess what how would you spice up her image on the ice you know her voice <laughs> I mean I'm a, I just feel like she's one of those Russian skaters that's so um, drenched in that particular method I don't know if it would be very easy to change her mm -hmm. you know some skaters are like Brady Tunnell I feel like she's just a raw piece of clay you could really shape into something. With someone like you're mentioning, I don't get the same feeling. You know? okay. okay. I guess I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the, a lot of the Russian method. Mm -hmm. um, having worked with Mishin, like as great as he is, it, it was frustrated because he was, he was a coach that just did not understand gliding on an edge or anything simple, or that idea of contrasting complexity with simplicity. And he would go, no, 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 I want tasty movement. Like, tasty movement to him is, it doesn't last long. It's not a gliding edge. Frantic, frantic, yeah. The, okay. <laughs> that makes sense when you see his skaters, though, because they don't have an edge. They don't have the basic... Because he doesn't like, doesn't see the value in that, unfortunately, with yeah. all the good that he has. Which is why it was such an interesting choice for Carolina, I thought, this season, to, to seek him out. You know, I, I was intrigued what that dynamic would have been like. So, hmm. I did feel a little bit like she went clockwise a lot, which most of the time Mishin has everything going counterclockwise, but for her, it's clockwise. I don't know if, if that was his influence, but okay. I just felt it more than other times. Hmm. I don't know if it's an or not. But, I mean, is, I have seen, because I know, because I've done programs for his skaters where I go back a couple months later. 
like I didn't do everything counterclockwise. Why is it going? Why is it going like this? Well, and then you wonder why? Why not? <laughs> some of these people that that are going to spend the time, work with a choreographer, you know, do all this sort of stuff, and and then if you're just going to let it go, I, I mean. Why did you invite the choreographer out to begin with? <laughs> it's, exactly. it's, it's a fascinating uh, sort of conundrum. Well, and again, I come back to the nuts and bolts of skating. Our, our skating alphabet, I like to call it, is based on eight edges. In those eight edges, they take us every direction possible. So why not use that alphabet in your choreography? And, you know, that's what multi-directional skating means. That's what, that's what the skating language is. And it's such a simple thing that's easy to forget especially nowadays when skaters aren't doing the compulsory figures. But we had to learn left and right and forward and backwards and inside, outside on everything. Yeah. And you couldn't favor right or from left or vice versa. You had to, you know, you may good at, be good at a right, forward, inside rocker figure, but they pick the left. You have right. to do it. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I, have to say, I have to laugh when you talk about Mishin because it seems every year Mishin picks a new choreographer especially for someone like Tuk Dimitriva. Like, every year, a new choreographer. One year, it's Jeff Buttle. The next year, it's Lambiel. Uh, this year, was Adam Solia. But it always gets changed. The program always winds up looking exactly the same. It looks mm -hmm. like Mishin choreographed it himself by the time that they arrived to competitions. So. Yeah, and I know because I've been there, and I've talked to other choreographers that felt the same way. It's a because he's really fun to work with. He's a super interesting guy. He's brilliant. But, you know, he just sees what he sees. And that's what happens. Sometimes I wonder what he's seeing. That's that's my. Uh... <laughs> no, sometimes I wonder what we're seeing. <laughs> like... Yeah. Yeah. It's it's funny because when um when Elizabeth skates, I often feel like she is um, rigid from like breastbone down, and then it's just the arms interpreting the music, and there's nothing going on in her back crossovers. That's yeah. So now, what do you feel like um, in a lot of these skaters also, like you're talking about Misha, and you, whether they're listening to the choreographers or not, for Elisabetta, like having a series of different choreographers, and yet we know other skaters that really stay loyal and see their whole career through the eyes of one choreographer. What is your take on that? Do you feel like you can make more of an impact the more you work with a skater, or do you like having something fresh or getting different perspective for each season's programs or, or how, how do you view that? Well, I have to say as a choreographer, it helps to work with someone more than a season. Like I said, I've worked with Sata for seven years, so I had the opportunity to help develop her. But at the same time, she's worked with other people. So I think that's a nice balance that, you know, she's tended to like Lori and I for competitive programs, but she's always experimenting. And she's done some exhibitions with um, Lambiel. And uh, so I think she's doing both. And I think that's what you should do. I think it's good to establish, and, and especially early in your career, if you just fly around to different coaches and choreographers, you're going to get a sort of a mishmash of, of language. So I think it's important to do both that have, have that stability of building a base. Like with Matt Savoy, it was a seven year process to get him to look like he did his last year. If I hadn't had those seven years, that wouldn't happen, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And now with him, were you doing both programs every season? Yeah, okay. I'm just curious, because sometimes I feel like certain skaters may get in a rut or the same, it becomes different versions of the same thing. As understandably, it, would, it could be difficult to keep reinventing the wheel with a particular re like relationship. Mm -hmm. But as you're saying, it is that consistency of the relationship that can get you, get you farther in certain areas. I would think. Well, it's also belief and trust. It's important as a choreographer. Yeah. Believes in what you're doing. And with Satoko, she really felt that it worked best with Lori and I. And sometimes we changed. I did mostly long program, but I did uh, one short program. Um, so I think that's important, you know, because when you trust the choreographer in both cases, you can get But yet she changed it up enough so hopefully she didn't become stagnant. Yeah, I think it's, it, it makes a lot of sense, I think, for her to use a choreographer like you and Lori. I think you're similar in a lot of ways in some of your... Yeah. I never Sim knew how Mao Asada could use Lori Nickel and Tatiana Tarasova. I thought that that was like too... Oh. 
completely <laughs> i never understood what was going on with mel i was like you need to pick pick a vision you know yeah uh, who are you? what is your voice <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah oh <laughs> that to me was always a little strange do you find that you get ideas for skaters when you work with them more because one thing is that I always knew that Lori would talk about having musical ideas for Michelle Kwan. So do you hear a piece of music and think of it for Satoko? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially with the, um, the, the Planets program. I had this vision of, and a good friend of mine actually was the one that brought it up, this Venus the Milo, you know, Wing Victory. And I just thought that was a great image for her as a goddess. And of course the planets are based on the gods and goddesses. So it became a story of a of, of possible love affair between Venus and Mars. And that became a great um, vehicle to show her contrast because she can be quite fierce, which I think came out in Mars. And she can be ethereal and beautiful too. So that's why it was one of my favorite programs because I felt it brought out those contrasts that sometimes people don't see in her. Mm. So now how much of the skating skills have... Is develop like is there a point where you can't get that much more improvement? You know, out of a skater, how much of Jeremy Abbott's ability was baked into what he did as an intermediate, a juvenile, a novice, something like that? Um, hard to answer with him because I started to work with him as a senior. Okay, so I couldn't tell you. I'm sure you saw glimpses of what he was going to be like, even as an intermediate. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was lucky with him to sort of hit a high point in his career. I did the, um, the tango program for him when he won the Grand Prix final. Um, and I think after that, he did some really good stuff too, but I think you need to keep finding your voice and, and honing your movement and not relying on, on what you've done in the past, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he... Well, because, first, sorry, Dave. Uh, for so many people like Carolina Costner, this evolution of her as an artist, you know, if you had told some of us <laughs> several years ago that this was going to be the case, we, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, so it's tricky for me in certain skaters to see who can develop this artistic voice and just they have not nurtured that yet and who it's, it's kind of a lost cause and we're just gonna try to get as many technical points for as long as we can. Um, but it's interesting because you're saying someone like Brady, you see that potential. Mm -hmm. uh, like in, in the United States specifically, are there others that you would love to like just get your hands on? Or do you feel like actually fulfilling that kind of potential has to happen at much earlier stages? Well, obviously, ideally it's, it's always better to get all the ingredients in the, in the recipe before you bake it rather than try and get it in later. But not you don't always have that you know, luxury to work with someone at an early age. But like I said, with someone like Matt that trusted me over seven years, and I think that's happened with Carol. You know, she has a passion for, that's number one, you have to have a passion to do it. Not just, what can my choreographer do for me and I do for the choreographer? It's a great street. Okay. And, there has to be a passion and interest in it, and not everyone has that. Carolina has that. So it enabled her to, to take off. And you, you, have, you can't be afraid to make mistakes either. She's done a couple problems which weren't great, but how else are you going to find what to do? if you're Because if you don't have that uh, sense of adventure, you do get stuck in one kind of sort of genre or stereotype. So I wonder, as a choreographer, Working with high-level skaters, do you already have your ideas for next season now? I guess when do you when do you feel the pressure for the creative process? You know, do you know like what's next for Satoko, or you know, how do you when do you kind of start talking and making those decisions? I mean, there's no the process is there's no process. You know, sometimes it'll, like actually a couple of months ago, something came up that I think is a good idea for Rika. Um, I haven't told anyone that yet, but. They just kind of come whenever, you know, for me, there's no like timing or, but for the most part right now, having the Olympics just ended, I really don't have the slightest idea yet, except for, except for a few little ideas in my head. 
Yeah, I'd always fear I'd be that skater. <laughs> Not that my waltz jump was in any, although I guess a waltz jump can be in the Olympics, as we saw. But um, <laughs> it's I, I always feared I'd be the kind of skater that was always like, eh, what am I going to do next year? <laughs> like That I'd be so excited to like try to pick all these different things. And yet it's funny to me how many people, it, it falls into their lap at the last minute or how many people wait to be told what they should do instead of enjoy that process of exploring what it could be. You know what I mean? I do you, what you just mentioned is the biggest killer of, of creativity is when you get too many people's opinion, you know, because you can't make everybody happy. Right. Um, Alex Johnson, when we did the, um, the Beatles program, there were a couple officials that said you know maybe you need to do something else and alex loved it at that point and we said no and then it turned out to be like a big success for him at nationals but um same thing with matt savoy's mission there was actually a coach that said oh i mean a, an official said i think that's just to this or whatever to that uh, turned out to be wrong so yeah, exactly. you need to no. write down those names and remember not to take their opinion for next year <laughs> Yeah. Take everything into consideration, but doesn't mean you have to do it. Yeah. In the end of the day, the skater has to believe in what they're doing. Otherwise, you're going to get pulled over by this sport and the system. You have to believe in something and be willing to take risks. Well, and that's even something uh, we, we've talked about all season with the Candyman uh, free skate of the Russian pair, <laughs> which was the questionable Christina Aguilera music edit. And it's not that... Uh, I'm a prude and I can't handle a Christina Aguilera music at it. It's that they didn't even believe it. So that's, <laughs> well, if you don't believe it, why are you forcing us to believe it? If you, you know, if you look embarrassed by it, guess how I feel right now, you know, watching it. Um, and I think it's like you say, if someone has that huge conviction, they 100% should, should be allowed to, to see it through. In the same way, Caitlin Osman, I, I think, you know, like you say, you know, this season we speculated, we're like, this is an unusual choice because we don't necessarily see her as this. And yet she had a really big Olympic moment because she believed it in that moment finally. And so we were along for the ride. Yeah, it was real strong. Yeah. I mean, think of all the, the adventures that Katerina Vitt had for, for good or bad. I got the feeling she believed in every single one of them, which considering she came from East Germany seems kind of amazing when you look back at it. Right, but I genuinely felt like she, probably, and her coach, you know, believed in some of those ideas, and she, she went out and executed it. <laughs> it's unfathomable as that may be that they believed in some of those choices. They did. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I believed in them too. By the end, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Is there one? I guess. Did you have a biggest pet peeve, I guess, as we wrap this up? Do you have a high and low moment of favorite programs from the Olympics, Tom? Hmm. I love the Rus the German pair team. Mm -hmm. And I love the French dance team. Okay. The highs in that. And I, and I guess Caitlin Osman, just because I didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. It was a nice moment. Because you sense when someone encapsulates that energy, whether it's your program of choice or not, that right. energy is undeniable. The moment is undeniable. Yeah. And do the costume change programs bother you, Tom? <laughs> oh, costume removal? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah whatever. Hey, it happens at Super Bowl, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I meant, I meant. Uh, like, he meant the intentional. Oh, ones. Yeah, the intentional ones that the French girl seems to be doing. Russian, the third ranked Russian pair, or second, second, I guess now here, yeah. second ranked Russian pair. They do a, you know, an open change the sleeves moment also, and you're just like, hey. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, is it legal? Yeah, <laughs> sadly, yes. I was like, I hope they're getting a deduction for this. Save this for the gala. <laughs> Not that I think either were invited, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> I mean, I guess it's fine as long as it doesn't become a prop element, prop instead of. As long as it's subtle, you know, <laughs> just like pull your sleeves up and the music gets more casual. Or, you know. yeah. yeah, the Sandy Grease Evolution edit seems to be a little bit of a prop. I think that's where it seems to cross a little bit of a line. Yeah, it's, yeah. 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 it's, it's uh, you know, unintentional, but entertaining. So, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we have so enjoyed getting your take on everything, Tom. Thanks so much for coming on The Skating Lesson. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You get the gold medal for the Madam Butterfly program. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>